Well, I think I'm supposed to start off asking Frank um, some questions. And uh, <laughs> you can make a statement if you like. Well, this is the rainiest, worst uh, yeah. time I remember uh, in spring, except for the time I traveled with you to Limerick mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> when we went to see your family graveyard in yes. the pouring rain. That was my introduction to that. That's part. the only time to visit a graveyard. <laughs> So, um, I mean, I thought that was probably representative of your miserable childhood. Yeah. And um, that's the main thing about me, Rose, the miserable childhood. <laughs> that sums it all. Without that, I don't know what I'd be doing. I was a teacher for 30 years. And, and uh, I did, I saw what the kids used to ask me about my life, and I would tell them. And the main component of it was the miserable childhood, which they enjoyed. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, the thought of me being miserable gave them great satisfaction <laughs> retroactively. So then I, I left teaching and I retired, as I say, and wrote this book, Angela's Ashes, which, which is... I remember Scott Fitzgerald saying that in, in American lives there are no second acts. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm here to prove him wrong. <laughs> uh, he died at 44, so he didn't have a, a way of knowing mm -hmm. that you can start another life at 59 or 60 the way I did. He died at 44. Camus did at 44. Thoreau did at 44. Hmm. Be careful, those of you <laughs> who are approaching that. Huh. So that, that, was, that was the story. Well, we were talking earlier about how uh, storytelling hmm. is what yeah. teaching about, is about and about yeah. what writing is about. And just to, do you want to fast forward well, if, to what you're writing next, if, or do if, you want to know? If no. if um, if you grow up in a in a civilization or a culture that that, that I did it was all storytelling, going back to ancient times when there were wandering storytellers, <clears throat> men going around the country called shanakis, and they would knock at your door and you'd have to open the door, because the shanaki yeah you always had to open the door. That was the thing about Ireland hosp hospitality. <laughs> It was sacred until the famine came along, and then, and then you didn't have anything to offer the visitor. But we were told, even it, the idea of hospitality came back again, and we were told uh, sometimes you didn't want to answer the door, and my mother would say, "Answer that door." <laughs> Why was it so important? Because that might be the holy family. <laughs> wow. What the Holy Family would be doing in Limerick is beyond me. <laughs> they really have to be hard up. <laughs> so, uh, then the Shanakis, the Shanakis wandered all over Ireland, these men, and for an evening you fed them and, and you gave them a bed of straw. They sat by the fire, smoked their pipes. Some of them were blind, many of them. And, and they tell stories all night and then they move on to the next house and there's just one. And this tradition maintained. When we sat, I look at my, I have three grandchildren now, and I look at them, and, they, and, they, and they're clicking on the computer, and, they're, and they're all of the stuff, and nobody talks. They don't know what to do with themselves. So, uh, when we were kids, and I'm not going back to the good old days or anything like that, the li life, the miserable childhood was rich in many ways, in the, se in the sense that we talked, and we described things. My mother went to a movie one night called Reap the Wild Wind. Paul had got a John yeah. Wayne and Ray Milland. John Wayne was a bad guy. So she went to the Coliseum Cinema and she came home and told the whole story, frame by frame by frame. And we had tea and we heard the whole, and we were fascinated. So we, she, that was a, a lesson in economics. Uh, if, <laughs> send one person to the movie. <laughs> You didn't have to pay $109 to see a Broadway show. <laughs> so uh, and then it's the storytelling. And then the thing is, what happened then with me was I had all this stuff in my head. <coughs> and I came to America. And there were, uh, American life seemed to be a series of grunts and whistles. <laughs> and and uh, our television came in. And then I was in the army in Germany. And then I came back and I went to college which in a sense was a big mistake, but if I hadn't, I wouldn't be here. Uh, so I, professors would get up and lecture. 
They wouldn't tell stories. Once in a while somebody would throw out an illustration. And then I, I left NYU with that in mind, this lecture system. And as I was saying to you earlier, young teachers go into the public high schools or any schools and have all this professorial stuff in their heads. Lectures, abstractions, postmodernism, etc, etc, etc. And then they start talking to these high school kids. And a high school kid has only two things in his mind. <laughs> He's either hungry or horny. <laughs> and, and I found that I, uh, in, in, in a canny way, although I resisted it, I can't say I was that bright, I realized the value of storytelling, but only because they tried to divert me from what I might, I might want to start talk about the glories of the semicolon. <laughs> and they divert me. <laughs> and asked me about, uh, Mr. McCall, where did you go to school? Did you go out with girls in Ireland? What religion did you have? And, and I would concede a few minutes of storytelling. And that began to grow. That began uh -huh. to snowball over the years. So finally, the kids would say, you should write a book, you should write a book. So I do what I'm told. <laughs> did you and do that was the storytelling. But I remember you were saying that um, your idea of school uh, in America, mm -hmm. oh, yeah. being so different, had come from American movies. Yeah, from your what? school. <laughs> when we were in school, I went to the. I went. I, I finished school at thirteen and a half, and uh, then in school in Ireland, it was rigid. Uh, a report came out recently in Ireland, 20,000 page report on child abuse in Ireland. Mm -hmm. But that had, we, we were abused in another way. There, were, there was no, I didn't have priests, brothers or nuns. I had uh, lay teachers, but they were brutal. And that's all they knew. I don't want to blame the English for everything, but we inherited, <laughs> we inherited a Victorian school system where rigidity was the order of the day. We sat in rows and we sat up and you didn't ask questions. You answer questions, and you better have the right answer, or you were knocked around the room, beaten. So uh, uh, there was no, I don't remember, and this only occurred to me last year, I don't remember a single moment of merriment or humor, except that it came out on, that we, the kids, understood it. The teachers wouldn't allow it. So um, uh, when when I when I, well, I, go, I would go to see American movies, and when I was a small kid, uh, the popular series was Mickey Rooney and Andy Hardy, mm -hmm. and everybody was so loose, and the sun was all the shining, <laughs> and the sun was never shining in Limerick, and I, <laughs> Mickey Rooney and Judy Garland, and he had his he was it was one movie where he's having growing pains, uh, uh, his adolescent, he's entering adolescence, and everybody seems to understand. <laughs> we were, had growing pains and nobody gave a shit. <laughs> there, was, there was no adolescence in Limerick. So uh, well, I was cranky when I was about 12 and uh, my mother says to my grandma, I don't know what to do with him. He's always grouchy. I don't know what to do with him. And my grandmother, who might have been a bit more sagacious, said, take him over to O'Connor the chemist. He has the growing pain powder. <laughs> My mother, she could barely afford this, and it would be sixpence, which my grandmother gave to my mother. So we go to Mr. O'Connor, the chemist, and ah, he says yes. So he goes to the back, and he comes out with, look, you know those cigarette papers you make cigarettes with? So he, he has this white stuff on the paper, and he says to my mother, put that under his tongue, and he'll feel better. And I felt wonderful. <laughs> I, I said, I, I, and it was cocaine. <laughs> Wow. Well, if it, if it was good enough for Sigmund Freud, it was good enough for me. <laughs> so I, 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 every few weeks then I began to get the growing pains. <laughs> no more O'Connor the chemist. So, but then I, I would go to these movies with Andy Hardy and so on, and all these kids in school, and they would drive up to school in these movies, in Porsches or whatever the hell they had in those days, and Mickey would be there and they'd wear the school letter and all this, and, and in class, and there's a benign teacher there, and he's wearing a bow tie, and hi Mr. Doyle, hi Mr. Smith, and, and, and then they'd, uh, and they'd discuss something, and, and the teacher would say, well, well, what do you think of that, Johnny? Well, I think, <laughs> not in Limerick, oh. <laughs> you didn't think. <laughs> Everything was dogma. 
Huh. Everything from from Euclid to Catholicism, everything was dog. When we learned the rules, and that's all. There was no curiosity. What? But what about Catholicism? Did you? That, that, I mean, that was the ultimate in dogma. Uh, we, when I was five years old, we began to we began to prepare for communion. First confession. First you got to confession, then you got to communion the day after. So you're, you're imbued very early with a strong sense of sin. <laughs> Things are either good or bad, uh, evil or sinful, evil and sinful. So, for instance, uh, to, look at a, to look at a picture of a girl in her underwear was a sin. And that's, that's a particular sin in Limerick. <laughs> uh, <laughs> So you'd have to confess, and we were told what the sins were. You were very, something, I used to look at the kids in my school in New York, in Stuyvesant High School, where all the kids are very bright, and I had the, a large Jewish population, and when we get to reading James Joyce's portrait of the artist as a young man, and I'm standing up there and I'm going on and on and about sin, and the kids are looking, these Jewish kids, liberal, liberal kids from the Upper West Side, readers of the New York Times, and <laughs> w, WQXR and all this stuff and all, all of them screwing around the night before and, and I, I said to them, do you know what the seven deadly sins are? <laughs> so how the hell can you enjoy yourself? <laughs> so, so I would tell them I would tell them the seven deadly sins which we learned at five <laughs> pride, covetous, lust, anger, gluttony, envy and sloth we were aware of all everything you did was a sin <laughs> for instance uh, uh, we were told uh, uh, we were told about the Virgin Mary but we didn't know what a virgin was and you were not to ask <laughs> a good mother was a Virgin Mary oh. that's what a good mother was so we were, we, we were really uh, uh, brainwashed. So, and we would go out in the schoolyard. We didn't go around and play stickball and stuff like that. We'd sit there reading, uh, discussing how many angels can dance in the head of a pin or what hell is really like. We loved that because the priests and the teachers were very good at describing hell. <laughs> they were a bit vague on heaven. Uh, you know, it's a place where you, you, you spend eternity gazing on God's countenance, which sounded very boring to me. <laughs> and I raised my hand, head, hand once and I said, is that all we get for leading good and virtuous, virtuous life, looking at God's countenance? And he, the teacher hauled me or the, 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 the uh, seat knocked me around the room. So this, you had to deal with this all the time. It was bad enough dealing with arithmetic <laughs> and Irish grammar, which is beyond mysticism. So, uh, <laughs> See, all the time you you were, you, were, you, were, you were always on the edge, but you had, in the, when you went home in the afternoon, you always had material, because you talk about the teachers because they were all a bit nuts. Half of them were alcoholics. One of them one of them fancied himself as a dandy, Mr. Cashin, and he used to stand in front of the classroom and he had a little mirror and he would trim his moustache, and he's looking into his mirror. I am watching you. I know your every movement. McCourt, come up here. McCourt, who created the world? God. God what? God, sir. Uh, and, and, and who is God? God is the creator and sovereign Lord of heaven and earth and all. You have to know all this stuff. So this, this, is, the, this is our conditioning. And I, then, then I would see these American movies, Mickey Rooney, and they're all asking questions, and they're all bouncing around, and boys are sitting with girls and squeezing girls and in the hallway, they're all rubbing up against. Jesus, going to the movies was really an occasion of sin. <laughs> Even looking at, at, at Roy Rogers' uh, wife, Dale, whatever the hell her name was. <laughs> and the horse. At her busty, uh, yeah. busty Dale. So that's, what, that's the kind of condition. Can you imagine, Rose, what it was like arriving in New York at 19? And one of the first places I see is Times Square. And it's wide open. 42nd Street at that time was a real sewer. 
and uh, having to cope with all of this uh, sudden freedom and still having this strong sense of sin and trying to and, and having no resources you had no resources you had no sense of self-esteem no sense of yourself that was discouraged uh, follow the dictates of the church and you'll go to heaven that's all that mattered uh, never and and poverty is it, there's nothing shameful about poverty poverty is the road to heaven although we didn't see the priests embracing it too much <laughs> do you think there's is there any other religion uh, that's better? No. The only religion, uh, maybe Unitarianism, they, they, when they pray they say to whom it may concern. Uh, <laughs> I can't, uh, maybe Buddhism. That, that's about the only one where they're cool about everything and they don't, they're not dogmatic. Uh, as far as I know, I don't know much about it, but, but I'm very interested. But as far as, I'm fascinated with Catholicism because of the power. There isn't a show like it in town. <laughs> they have the best liturgy, they have the ceremonials, the rituals, and the psychology, and the music. And the music. And the music. Yeah. And, and the art. <laughs> I mean, where would, where would art be without Rome? But I love, I, and I love the gradations of art in the Catholic Church too. They've got, Ellen and I have traveled from France down to Spain <coughs> to Italy. And I notice France is the melange of art. But Spain, in Spain, when you look at the pictures of various artists uh, depicting the descent from the cross, Christ taken off the cross, um, or the cross itself, this uh, uh, in Spain is very bloody. And Christ wears a grass skirt in many of them, but and and then and it's 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 merciless and has a strong sense of sin. This is my impression. You get to Italy then, and there's the Pieta, the gentle, kind mother, with the son as all the she is, and 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 there's and, and there's there's more love. There's more love in the Italian. So you, when when I when I look back at Catholicism, and I think what was done to me, and my contemporaries, uh, and what was done for me, it gave me all the stuff to, to. But I sometimes I think, would I be better off without it? Would I be like my 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 grandchildren or my nephews and so on, without any religion whatsoever. And they grow up, and it also is a cultural matter. Because you're, you're, you grow up as a Catholic, you're aware of things like Gregorian chant, <laughs> and the Stations of the Cross, and Latin, and the rest of it. So there's a richness in that. But the penalty you pay for the Catholicism I grew up in is very heavy. <laughs> well, when you were talking about Unitarianism and to whom it may concern, is it your Catholicism, or what that led you, uh, you and the Irish priests, to found concern, that, oh. which, for which you got a big award after Haiti when you were. Well, Concern is an international org, uh, uh, organization devoted to doing good works around the world, founded by two priests, but it's become it's, it's become very broad, and. Uh, there's always this element, there was always this insistence on charity by certain people. Mm -hmm. For instance, we wouldn't have survived in Limerick except for the St. Vincent de Paul Society in Limerick because my, when my father took off for England and <laughs> took to the bars, he was making money. It was during the war and he was making plenty of money like all the other men. He, never, he didn't send anything home. So my mother was reduced to beggary, literally. Beg I saw her begging and I was ashamed of her. Mm. And I'm ashamed Ashamed of my of my shame, but uh, she would have to like a lot of the women in Limerick would have to go to this house uh, run by the St. Vincent de Paul Society, and they'd give my mother this ticket, a docket, to go to a local grocery show where we were allowed to have. They'd give us some flour, tea potatoes, and a ticket to go and get wood, blocks of wood for the fire. They kept us alive. Otherwise, we would have been put in in a, an orphanage. Excuse me. Uh, which is also a, a, reform, a reform school, to put the criminal kids and the orphans into the same place. 
<laughs> and they were all treated the same. From, from the age of t little kids up to 16 or 17, they were all treated badly, starved. I had, because I had two cousins, three cousins in these places. And so there was a brutal period. And it was, it was, I'm not saying it's parallel or the same as the Holocaust, but these things were going on in Ireland as they were going on in, in Auschwitz. <laughs> but the brutal, no, there's, I, I can't understand the, 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 the Holocaust at all, and I can't, it's very hard for me to understand priests and brothers treating kids the way that they were treated. We were lucky we escaped that, and only because my mother went out and begged. So, but you were with kids in Haiti. There wasn't. Oh yeah. That was poverty, not brutality, oh, right? The I poverty mean, I, in Haiti was frightening. Yeah. I thought I knew poverty, but when you combine it with the tropics, it's something else. <laughs> and gangs roaming the streets. The hair stood up in the back of my head. So, uh, and 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 it. It's a poverty that seemed utterly hopeless, Haiti. Like Bill Clinton is down there now, I think, trying to do something about it. But the people, like the people in Limerick, in our lane, the, the, uh, hmm. they had dignity. And you are, remember, uh, reading about how you took these kids to breakfast. Yeah. I don't know what else, you, well, how you fed them, how you talked to them. Well, I, went, I, I visited various schools in Haiti and, and I looked at the kids and I saw myself. Yeah, that's, that's what I wanted. And they would come to school in the morning, no food. And the teachers, these are private schools run, run by men and women in Haiti, because they want, and the, kids, the people are very insistent on, edu on education. Even if the kids have to go to school hungry, and the teachers would tell me, these people are in the school, we, had, we don't have any money. And then the kids yeah. would go home and work in the fields in the afternoon, and, then, and uh, they'd, they'd get some food in the evening. And then one man in, in, in Port-au-Prince itself told me he had about 18 or 19 kids there, and each June they would get a report card. And he said, but they had to bring in the year's fee to get the report card, which was $9. And a lot of them didn't have the $9. And he said he couldn't withhold the report cards because there was so much pride. And outside, outside his school, there's this old canal filled up with garbage and rats running around. And it's, it's, it's beyond belief, the kind of pub. And I know it's probably worse in Africa, but this is at our doorstep. Right. And it, it, it kept me thinking, if, all of that kind of stuff keeps me thinking of what's done to people. You don't emerge from that state of mind today or tomorrow. That because I, in my own case, and I don't want to harp on myself too much, it took me a long time to develop any self-awareness and to understand that this anger that I had, I would explode all the time, it came from my background. I didn't know how to handle things. I couldn't stand back and be objective. Because uh, in Limerick, for instance, if there, was, if there was a bit of a showdown, I went into it. I knew no rules, the Marcus or Queensbury rules. If there was a fight, you went into it until somebody was knocked down or knocked off. Something. We, we didn't know anything else. And even when I came to the States and I started going to bars, I got into trouble. Hmm. And, I, and I, then I began to realize, I think it was going into the army, being drafted by the US Army during the Korean War, because they, they were worried America might lose, so they drafted me. So, <laughs> and I learned some discipline over there, and then I went to NYU. Which wasn't a great illuminating experience, but I was beginning, to, I took a course in psychology. Oh, as I said, this is what it's all about. I thought it was all Catholicism. <laughs> <laughs> so was there a moment in your being educated or your educating your students uh, when you suddenly saw um, that you were going to take another path and write your uh, biography, autobiography? Uh, there was so always forth? this itch to write. The, the, it was the one thing in the world that I admired was the writer. 
because I was always reading from it, books were very scarce in Limerick. That's the way to get kids to read. Don't give them any books <laughs> and, and take away all electronics. So I think the first book I read was the one I just told the Catechism of the Roman Catholic Church, the little green catechism. Who made the world? God. Who is God? God is the creator of the Lord, heaven and earth, and, earth. and then all the sins and the and, and the virtues and the sins and so on. And that was the first book. And we read that. Uh, we, they didn't have to teach us three. And we read, we read in Irish and in English. Irish started the day we walked into the school. That was the first thing I learned was the Irish alphabet. And then, then the, 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 the catechism. And on, on Mass and Sundays, you had these missiles that were uh, supplied in English and Latin. So willy-nilly, you picked up some Latin. So I... Um, uh, then I began to, uh, then books, books being very scarce, one time I was in Woolworths in Limerick with my mother at Christmas and it, there was a, 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 a counter filled with these cheap paperbacks and I started reading this one, the most unlikely book for a, a Limerick kid called Tom Brown School Days, uh -huh. an English school, private school, public schools that they call and, and it was, uh, I was fascinated with here are these kids in a school in England, boys, and all they have to do is go to school, but then they have all, and they wear little caps and blazers and so on. There was a picture, and my mother said, do you like that book? I said, I do. And it wasn't easy to read. I was only six or seven. She, she, sixpence it cost, the same as the cocaine. And, uh, <laughs> So she got me that book and I made, that was my first book. And then I discovered, again, uh, there weren't too many, the books were very scarce in school. I remember the first book, the book that was handed out to us was called, it was a poem by Oliver Goldsmith, huh. about 26 pages, The Deserted oh, Village, yes. <laughs> which we were required to memorize. So was I. So, uh, <laughs> that, and, and then I discovered P.G. Woodhouse, <laughs> and th yeah. that's been my bedside reading ever since. <laughs> when you're in the dumps, read P.G. Woodhouse, <laughs> uh, uh, rather than Jean-Paul Sartre. <laughs> <laughs> But were you writing then? Or I, not? I was always scribbling because I thought that was magic. Uh -huh. When I was, um, <laughs> I think in the fifth grade in Ireland, I decided, because I had some, the teachers told me, uh, you know, they gave me some encouragement. No. I decided when I was, when I was in fifth grade, uh, I was going to write a history of Ireland. <laughs> From the beginning of the world. Oh. <laughs> up to my, the date of my birth. <laughs> That's what I Irish is think. So, and I had no paper. Now it's hard for this audience to imagine having no paper. Of course you had paper. No, we didn't have paper. So I was walking down the street and I saw uh, a house being uh, renovated or demolished and there was a big truck outside with all the stuff thrown into it and there were rolls of wallpaper old wallpaper and I took the wallpaper home and I scraped off the mortar that old plaster and I started writing my history of Ireland in it but then my mother was looking at me and th 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 this is ridiculous things were so scarce paper was so scarce to start the fire because if, if you want to start a fire you have, have paper wood and coal paper wood and peat or turf so uh, I saw her eyeing my wallpaper <laughs> I said, like, she's not getting this. So I, I took it to school. I got into school early. And the teacher had a closet, and I put it on top of the closet where it couldn't be seen. So uh, then I wanted to continue my history of Ireland. And uh, uh, I didn't know how I was going to do it. I didn't want to take it home. It would wind up in the fire. Uh, so I waited till everybody left the room, and then I went back into the school room. And I sat with my, and you, I didn't have a pen. There was a pen you dipped into an inkwell, mm -hmm. and the ink would sometimes spread, and that drove me crazy. And uh, so I was writing my history of Ireland, and the teacher, Mr. O'D, came back. He said, what are you doing here? Uh, and I was terrified. I said, I'm writing, sir. What are you writing? Um, history of Ireland. <laughs> How could you be writing a history of Ireland? And I was very, maybe, airy guys, because I'm writing it. Uh, he said, when did you start? I said, the other day. I mean, when did you start in time? I said, from the beginning. Where? <laughs> the Garden of Eden. <laughs> And I had to explain all of this, and, uh, and he, he didn't sneer at me, 
he just let me go on and I put my I put my rolls of wallpaper back but I got weary of it because I could never see myself coming up to my own birthday yeah. uh, so but the, and that and he looked as he looked over my shoulder at son of it he said you're not a bad writer and that was the first word of encouragement oh. I ever had yeah and that was that then I was I was addicted yeah and I and then the, the, uh, in the next class mr. O'Hallan when when he gave us an exam on history or Irish history or or anything like that, he would say, now McCourt, you have to stop after two pages, because I would want to go on and on and on. Uh, wow. So that, that was my early encouragement, as well as reading. Yeah. Uh, strangely enough, the books that came our way were good stuff. Uh, the first book that shocked me into an awareness of the fact that you could write in a nice, casual, contemporary, or colloquial way was Mark Twain. Was uh, Huckleberry Finn? Oh, I said you can write like this, and I tried it in school. Mm -mm. <laughs> That's not English. But you know, I remember Bill Styron telling me the same thing. Is that right? That Huckleberry Finn yeah. was his first yeah. favorite and remained yeah. his favorite book, and that he yeah. tried to write like Mark Twain. Yeah. Well, my, my, I, I, PG, I got to P.G. Woodhouse before I got to, <laughs> and you can imagine a kid in a Limerick slum writing like P.G. Woodhouse about, about the Wooster, uh, Bertie Wooster, and, and, and Jeeves, the valet. And my brothers, my brothers and I used to talk like English up the upper, uh, oh, I say, by ch he, you, uh, that's, uh, don't act like that, chappy. <laughs> it was false, but it was, it was, it was good stuff. And it, exp it certainly expanded our vocabulary and gave us notions. Uh, my, my, my mother used to say, you're rising above yourself. <laughs> That's the greatest sin of all. <laughs> was there one sin that was not as bad as the worst yeah. sin in the worst the worst sins in Ireland were sins of the flesh. Uh, so everything was banned. We had a censorship board, and everything everything was banned. There was an English newspaper called the News of the World that used to have stories of divorce cases in England about adultery and fornication. There was a, a rape case in Limerick, a gang rape, when I was a kid, and this woman was taken out by a bunch of men out the dock road and raped, and uh, six of them, and they were tried. And we read the re accounts in the local paper, the Limerick Leader. The word rape was never mentioned. Hmm. Criminal offence, it was called. That's how heavy the clergy sat in Ireland at the time. They controlled everything. No more. Now it's, now it's musical beds all over Ireland. <laughs> <laughs> um, last month in Boston, I um, saw Jerry Adams, who began to talk about uh, how he started writing in prison mm -hmm. when he was a teenager because that's the first time he felt the f freedom. I guess yeah. he got the paper there to sit down and write and he wrote all these chronicles of um, his youth and crime and then he did his autobiography. He's quite a good writer and then uh, he said he had just started to write poetry and he wanted to read me some mm. of his poems and he read them all first in Irish and then in English. Yeah. And I, I'm just wondering, do you still know any Irish? Oh, yeah. Do you write any poetry? I'm do do just I wondering where it's going I, I, for you. I, I try poetry. That's not my, <laughs> that's not my talent. Uh, I, but Irish is coming back to me. Even though I only had it till I was 13, but it's coming back to me. At the strangest times, Ellen and I might be driving along and I see a car in the field. Fiacar and Ma in, in, I forget the word for field, Eugene knows. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, <laughs> the, uh, it's coming back to me, little, little phrases are coming back to me. Uh, and I, uh, I, I don't see why that language should die. It's, it's, it's colorful and it has phrasings that are, that are intriguing. So, uh, I know, uh, poetry, we had to memorize a lot of poetry. And we were told that poetry rhymes. <laughs> you know, it's iambic uh, pentamerous, that's all. But, and then you have to discover poetry. You have to, after that Irish education, I had to discover everything myself. Well, I know you discovered uh, singing early and all the yeah. Irish songs. And I can't imagine a session 
with you even an hour oh, long cool. without your singing something. So no. <laughs> you want to sing for us? <laughs> Well, I could sing you the worst, most sentimental mother song ever written in Ireland. We're known for mother songs, oh. Mother McCree on down. <laughs> so this is one, I don't know if I'm up to it, but I'll, I'll try it. This is one of these immigrant songs. Boy, do we have immigrant songs. <laughs> do we have lamentation? With the most, don't talk about the Jews to me and the, and, and the guilt and lamentation. They, they haven't discovered the Irish yet. <laughs> Miles deep. Twas twenty years ago today, I grasped my mother's hand. She kissed and blessed her only son, gone to a foreign land. The neighbors took me from her breast and told her I must go. Yet I could hear my mother's voice, though the words were faint and low. Oh, good. Bye, Johnny dear, when you're far away, don't forget your dear old mother far across the sea. Write a letter now and then, send her all you can. <laughs> don't forget where'er you roam that you're an Irishman. We sailed away from Queenstown, that was the cove of Cork. A very pleasant voyage we had, and soon were in New York. <laughs> I had plenty of friends to greet me there, and work I got next day. But for all their hospitality, I could hear my mother say, Oh, goodbye, Johnny dear, when you're far away. Don't forget your dear old mother far across the sea. Write a letter now and then, send her all you can, and don't forget where'er you roam, that you're an Irish man. The other lady, a letter came from far across the sea. It came from dear old Ireland, it was addressed to me. And after I had opened it, sure this is what I read. My dear old John, I am sorry to say that your poor old mother is dead. Oh, good. Bye, Johnny dear, when you're far away, don't forget your dear old mother far across the sea. Write a letter now and then, send her all you can, and don't forget wherever you roam, that you are an Irishman. It isn't every day you hear a lyric Irish tenor, is it? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> We're so, going to oh. take time for a, for a few questions. Frank, sure. is that okay? Do they have to sing? Or a few answers. <laughs> <laughs> a few, time for a few questions. Hands? Well, they're afraid to sing. <laughs> um, I want to thank you for uh, teaching my son at Stuyvesant High School. The, uh, wow. <clears throat> So I can't. Is he a lawyer? <laughs> How did you guess? I did. He's he's a Jewish lawyer, <laughs> right? And it was because my family was so liberal that I'm not Catholic today. Because <laughs> when I came home, I was nine years old, and a friend of mine had showed me the Catholic Church, which which was as impressive as you described it. And I said that I believed in. Uh, <clears throat> I. I believed in Mary, and I was going to become Catholic. My mother said, fine. And now I'm not a Catholic as a result of that. <laughs> but I just want to say that I don't blame you for, for all my problems with my son. Um, I think one of the things is that your stories are so riveting. We don't understand some of the tortures that 
take place inside a good family. So, uh, but the uh, the other thing is, is that I'm thinking in terms of your song about your mother. Um, was there something going on, allowing the curiosity, the hope? the energy that you had not to be extinguished because something was going on in the first months of life mm -hmm. that allowed you to survive? Well, life, uh, th there was the school and then there was life in the streets. And there was all, it was, it was very, as I said, uh, despite the miserable child, it was a very rich existence because we told stories all the time, we sang all the time, and we were addicted to Hollywood when we had, when we had the movies, uh, the money to go to the movies. There was all, and then there was this excitement of travel, not like now you go off, but if somebody was going to America, Jesus, they had, uh, they used to have what they call an American wake the night before when, when you went to America, but that, in those days, if people went to America, they were not expected to return. So, and, and also, the wake itself. We couldn't wait for people to die. <laughs> Because, and because uh, we had real wakes where you'd gather in, in somebody's kitchen and they were, somehow, the, like the way they do in Haiti, no matter how poor they are in Haiti, they get money together to celebrate the dead and to find them a decent burial place. But we had these wakes where there was always, always seemed to be money for Guinness and a tart of whiskey and maybe some cakes. So there was all of the, these are these were the ingredients of our life. And, the, and we, and that's the difference between um, my life, uh, the, the life of the kids in New York. When I went into my classrooms in the morning, I'd listen to the kids in Stuyvesant High School or Staten Island or whatever, they would talk about what they watched the night before. We, when we went to school, the master, schoolmaster, would tell us, shut up, because we were talking about what we did the night before. So there was always, we never wanted to go home at night time. But you'd hear the women calling us saying, come on, come on. And so there was always that excitement. And, and on top of that, this sense that someday we're getting out. We go to the top of that lane, turn left, down the street, and up to the railway station. America, England, Australia. So, so there was always a sense of optimism and hope and energy. So there was never, we never, we never ever used the word, I'm bored. <laughs> never. We didn't know what that word meant. That was for the movies. Frank, over here on the side. Um, I, I was raised Irish Catholic, and I amazingly I identify with many of the things that you said, even though it was in the United States. Um, but I guess my question is, how do you make peace with the past? Or maybe, maybe that's not even the question. How do you... How do you regard, say, uh, Irish Catholicism today or the Catholic Church today? Well, the only thing you can do, do you know a, a lady named Anne Mira? She's married to Ben uh, Stiller. Mm. Barry, what's her name? Jerry Stiller. What well, I was talking to her one night. She, she she went through the nuns, and she said it was hard. And so she said, I don't know, I don't know. I said, and Anne has written the play. I said the only thing you can do with this stuff is use. One of the best titles of, of a book I ever came across was the uses of the past. Oh, so yeah. there it is. You were given this gift of misery, <laughs> and it's rich. And you might as well, that's how I deal with it. And, the, and here I am, I'm 78, and I'm learning. I'm learning to learn, which I should have known. When I looked at these kids in my schools in New York, Stuyves and High School, where the kids were, you know, half them were in therapy, and, and, and telling me that I should go and do likewise. Uh, but I, uh, uh, very late in life, no, I. This is one of the things I resent about the professors at NYU. And they, yet they teach Shakespeare and they teach this. They never said, well, this is you. This guy Hamlet is you. Horatio, you, you, you're going to be King Lear someday. And, you, and, and everything every writer wrote is you. They never told us it. This, this was material for an exam or for papers. It never had to do with me. I was Romeo. I got, I dug Romeo, and so on. Not that I wanted to go as far as he did, but uh, they, they, they didn't make it. The, the big word is relevant. So what I, all I can do with my past now is use it, and I, I think about it, and I'm more. As I said to Rose a while ago, I'm so fascinated with what they did to us and how they did it, and the, the 
magic of Catholicism. The, the vestments, the incense, the bells, the candles, the organ and the loft, the choirs and the various holidays. Boy, did they hook us. And I loved it, and I loved it when the priest came out and talked about hell. That was better than any, any Twilight Zone. <laughs> Frank, we have one last question right here. Um, first of all, I want to thank you for Angela's Ashes. I absolutely love that book. It cheered me because it made my own childhood seem very light and very easy. And I, you know, I, I was like wonderful in comparison. I didn't get that. I said your book cheered me because it made my own childhood when I thought I was a miserable oh. child living in a slum um, seem like you know I, I, I lived in a mansion. The other thing I want to ask is um, are your organization concerned? Are, what are you doing in Haiti? What's that? What, are you continuing with work through your oh, organization yeah, yeah. for Haiti? Yeah. I was there nine years ago, and I have a friend, Sherman Malone, who has a, um, an organization called Mary Care, and she works in Port-au-Prince and also has a, a hospital, not a hospital, a, a, a health center, and, a, and, a, um, and they're working on a school in a little village called Jack Seal. And, um, Going to Haiti is like you, your preparation needs to be, imagine yourself going to hell and prepare yourself for that and then you, you can withstand Haiti. And that's how I felt when I went yeah. there. There's no excuse for it. Yeah. This country at our doorstep. One, one more quick question here in the middle. Uh, first of all, thank you. Uh, this is just phenomenal. I had no idea that I was seeing you today. I just came with her. <laughs> Second that was the honest section always. <laughs> well, while we're on the honesty thing, um, this is actually a question that I know that she would be dying to ask you, but I'm going to ask you, and uh, forgive me if it seems a bit trite, but is there a book, one book, that if you were to say, go read that book, I really love that book, your, if the, other than the catechism and the other Catholic stuff, <laughs> I read that too, it was pretty good. Uh, <laughs> Would you, is there a book, a favorite book that comes to mind? You're like, I love this book. Is there this. a book? Yeah. One uh, book? You, a book, your favorite, aside from one of the ones you wrote. <laughs> uh, nothing, no. Oh, I'm not that fascinated with what I've written. You look, you look, you look at what you did and you, you want to do it again, but uh, is it? Um, what, Shakespeare? You know, you, you dip into Shakespeare any, anywhere and uh, it, it nourishes you. I, I'm interested in books that nourish me. Most, most, most of the s novels nowadays don't, don't, don't nourish me. I'm, I'm getting more and more uh, old-fashioned. I, li I like to read Juvenal, uh, the Roman, because it's, it's satirical and it, it's, it, we, need it. we need him nowadays. But I'm not saying I read that all the time. I, I, I keep various books by the bedside and I just dip into them. There isn't any there is the old question, if you, would if you were to take one book onto a desert island, what would it be? I think maybe the Bible, the King James Bible, even though I'm not a Protestant. And we were forbidden to read the King James Bible. <laughs> so I, I think that it's so rich and it has, it has uh, illuminated so much of Western life. It would be the Bible. It's music. Some music here today. I'd like to thank Rose Styron and Frank McCourt for being with us today.